So thank you for everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Chris with Channel Bytes. My partner in crime is Cam uh, uh, right next to me. Uh, we will be hosting today's event. Uh, just a, a little bit of housekeeping items. Uh, if you do have any questions, please use the uh, Q&A button on the, uh, uh, on the Zoom app. Um, you can use the chat also, but Q&A makes it a little bit easier for us to track and we will answer those questions as we uh, go along. Uh, today we have uh, a very special guest, uh, Chris with the 650 Group. Um, and, I, and I don't think uh, Darren needs an introduction here, but uh, Darren from Cambium and Alan from Cambium Network. So thanks guys for uh, joining today's call. Before we get started, uh, why don't we, uh, why don't you guys uh, introduce yourself? Let's, let's, start with, uh, let's start with Chris. Hi, my name is Chris Dupuy, and I'm a founder and technology analyst at 650 Group. We do quantitative uh, and qualitative market research in 21 different areas of the technology industry. Thanks for having me today. Thank you. Alan, what about yourself? Uh, so um, I'm the product manager in Cambium, uh, response for same wave 60 gigahertz. I've been with the Cambium for uh, actually the same calculation for over 20 years. Great. And Darren, I'm sure people have heard this intro before, so why don't you give it a different well, way? I, I, I absolutely will. So I'm Darren Hermans. I'm a product manager at Cambium. Uh, this year, I, I took the jump into an electric vehicle. And uh, I got to tell you, I wish I'd done it years before. Um, best experience I've had. i really enjoying it. Awesome. Well, I don't know if you guys watched uh, Tesla's Battery Day uh, recently. They, uh, they're doing all sorts of cool things to uh, redesign the way batteries are made. And they announced that the, the new Model S, the flagship model, is going to get like 550 mile range. So it's, uh, it's definitely entering a new world. Uh, so, Cam, what are we talking about today? I don't know, but I'm actually hoping that the three experts we have on the panel are going to help us. We are chatting 60 gigahertz and specifically uh, what 60 gigahertz means from a wireless backhaul point of view. Uh, and I think there's a lot of applications. I personally am very excited about this technology. And I'm going to use this opportunity to lead in actually to the first question, if I may. Um, and this is an easy question, I promise. Um, 60 gigahertz is not new technology. And so in my preparation for this, I uh, found an article from Ars Technica in December of 2016 talking about uh, 4.6 gigabits Wi-Fi and 60 gigahertz. So this is not a new idea. So I'm hoping that Darren, you can help uh, you know illuminate uh, some some of those questions for me. Give me give me some answers. What's up with 60? Yeah. Well, you know what, uh, Cameron, there there are no easy easy questions. I got to tell you, uh, but but this 2016 is not the first time we've heard about it either. Um, I think I started hearing about 60 gigahertz technology 10 or more years ago. Uh, the idea back then, many years ago, was that we would use this for uh, maybe a laptop docking station or a multimedia station or something like that. Maybe replace the audio cables in your home theater system. Um, but none of that really, really worked out. It's like uh, an old engineer I used to work with, great, fantastic uh, guy who really designed a lot of systems. He used to say, I used to share these ideas with him and he'd just go, hmm, shows thought needs work. Uh, it was kind of his, his thing. And, and, and that's what this means, right? 60 gigahertz for a long time was shows thought needs work needs a lot of work. And I think we've done the work, right? We've put in the time, we've put in the effort. And, and now we've used that same, same basic, uh, you know, frequency. And we've kind of reimagined how we're going to use it and how we're going to deploy it. So now we're looking at multi gigabit broadband networks using that frequency. But that's not all there is to it. Um, you know, we're looking at getting moving this technology outdoors, not just putting it inside a house or a or a conference room where it has a limited capability, limited use case. But now we take it outdoors, we add carrier type features like, like, um, like carrier aggregation. So we can now double the bandwidth, we can get more connectivity, transmit faster, lower latency, uh, extremely lower latency, now down into the, into the microseconds so that we can support these really high bandwidth uh, applications. Uh, Alan, do you wanna jump in there? Sure. Um, so you're right. 60 gigahertz is not new, uh, but in the past, 60 gigahertz is mainly used for point to point. And also not many countries open the 60 gigahertz as well. With the, uh, you know, the technology moving, the regulatory body also moving, we see more and more 60 gigahertz has been opened globally. You know, in U.S. Uh, has opened 12 gigahertz. Same thing in Canada, 
in Japan, in Europe, uh, the like in uh, Czech, uh, Czech, in UK, they just opened the 60 gigahertz as unlicensed band. So now make the 60 gigahertz not only for P2P, it can also use for point to multipoint. More than that, the technology also evolving. Now we have the new standard, new standard coming out, the 11AY standard, make 60 gigahertz more suitable for a high density deployment. And given the natural uh, characters, the oxygen absorption, you know, really make 60 gigahertz an ideal spectrum for those high capacity, high density, short distance deployment. And, uh, you know, we know the five gigahertz um, can do the coverage uh, and they can do the penetration and they come with the 60 gigahertz as a uh, composite with that, we can do high capacity, short, short range line of set connection. So this, may, this makes, uh, you know, 60 gigahertz a good fit or uh, an unnecessary toolbox uh, for your network design. Yeah, you know, Alan, that's a lot of, it's a lot of tech talk. And I think you, you and I are dropping some, some of that tech talk on people, but you know, cause we, 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 we get, the, we get the privilege of working with engineers all day and, and, uh, and that's, that's a great experience. But, but you know, at the end of the day, that doesn't build a network, right? Mm -hmm. Frequencies don't build a network. One product does not support your business. It doesn't work. Uh, so what, what we're doing with this technology is we're taking this and we're, we're partnering with companies like uh, Facebook Telegraph. We're an early adopter of that technology. Gets us redundant multi-input mesh technology uh, to really build out a resilient network. Uh, it's multi-gig redundant. So that's what we're, that's what we're doing. That service providers are going to benefit from that. Well, who else? What about, what about an enterprise systems integrator? You know, the guy who's, whose bread and butter is deploying enterprise networks inside the building and outside of a building. Well, now that guy can use this same technology quickly, repeatably, and predictably. He can connect up multiple buildings. It could be two or three buildings, four buildings in a, in a, a you know, third party logistics uh, campus area could be higher education, you know, campus, uh, higher education campus, any place you need to start to connect buildings together, that enterprise systems integrator, he's going he's gonna to love this because keyword there is repeatable and predictable. That's, that's, a, super, that's a super advantage of this um, technology. One more, one more. How about municipal Wi-Fi? Municipal Wi-Fi. Uh, there's a Canalis report that, that Cambium saw that talks about Outdoor Wi-Fi growth is, is 9% year over year. It's growing fast, fast growing market. Um, other, other sources say there's going to be hundreds of millions of Wi-Fi hotspots in just a few years around the globe. So if you're a municipal network, why are you doing this? Well, you want to give people connectivity to municipal resources. You want to get your staff resources. You want points of interest to attract travelers and, and visitors to your city and your area. Lots and lots of reasons, lots of reasons for municipal Wi-Fi. And so, so that's, that's three things right there, service providers, enterprise, and uh, municipal Wi-Fi. So Chris, can you give us the, uh, your perspective from a researcher standpoint? Yeah, I sure can. <clears throat> so there are in fact many alternatives for, for backhauling on a, in a campus environment um, like, we're, like we're talking about. But I have to say, 60 gigahertz spectrum is is quite unique, and um, just wanted to step back and just talk about you know what 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 can we do uh, to serve um, campus backhaul. So there are uh, from a frequency perspective, there's like three different kinds of spectrum. There's licensed, unlicensed, and lightly licensed or shared spectrum, and um, What's happening here with 60 gigahertz is kind of similar to what mobile operators are talking about when they talk about fixed wireless. Uh, they're mostly talking about millimeter wave, um, which, is, which has a lot of similarities to 60 gigahertz, um, like we're uh, talking about here on this call. Um, but uh, the difference being 60 gig is unlicensed, so it allows um, pretty much anybody to, to deploy equipment in, this, in, this, um, in the spectrum. And uh, just to set the stage here, unlicensed spectrum generally uh, involves um, the following spectrums, 900 megahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, five gig, um, 60 gigahertz, like we're talking about here today, and, and soon, six gigahertz. Um, but what's important to, to keep in mind is 60 gigahertz is unique because it can address dense environments and, and it is a, it's a line of sight technology Therefore, it can be deployed in, in dense areas 
without uh, significant risk of, of interference, which is what you get uh, with most uh, every other unlicensed technology that I listed. So 60 gig is, is, um, is, uh, is very well suited for, for making um, uh, campuses from one building to another or bringing an internet connection to, to a campus, that kind of thing. And um, it's, a, it's quite, a, quite, a unique, um, quite a unique spectrum and the technology that rests on there is, is now, um, now quite exciting. Cool. So before we get to a couple of questions, I just see, Alan, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I think uh, um, just the two more technical things. One is the six gigahertz high frequency. So you have a smaller antenna with high gain. So the six gigahertz radio is much smaller compared with like uh, 900 megahertz, 2.4 gigahertz or five gigahertz. That's just one thing. The other thing is when we move to the 60 gigahertz, the beam width is narrower, but on the other side with the uh, beam forming antenna technology, uh, instead of people worry about beam forming, uh, the beam width is very narrow. On six gigahertz, we do the auto beaming, beam forming, then alignment become pretty easy. You literally point to the right direction, you're done. Uh, you don't need to do the, or fine tune for the, for the precise alignment. Uh, so that's a little bit unique about 60 gigahertz compared with those low frequency today. We have a few questions, guys. I want to I want to just get these in here. Uh, and by the way, I want to remind everybody attending, please send your questions via the Q&A just so uh, we don't get them lost in the chat. We've got a few in here. Uh, I'm just going to start off with a few. And I, I think this is, uh, I don't know if this is a Darren or an Alan question. Let's toss it out there. Uh, this is from Joel. Do we see Cambium creating a 70 to 80 gigahertz product in the future? So uh, let me try to address this one. We are selling uh, a 70, 80 gigahertz product today. It's called 820E and 850E, which deliver up to 10 gig full duplex capacity. You can also do the bunk, you know, X, X pick to make it even double like a 20 gig full duplex with 850E. That's product is shipping since last year. Um, and that will be our 70, 80 gigahertz solution, you know, to say the, to do the backhaul for 60 gigahertz, or you do the fiber extension using the E-band. Roger that. Um, how many miles, how many MMLES can we use 60 gigahertz? Uh, I know it's used for short distance with high throughput. I guess, I think the question here is what's the range? Uh, the range is really depends on, let's talk about point to multi-point. Uh, of course, depends on where you are and what the capacity you need, what the link availability you're looking for. But generally speaking, we talk about 200 meters to uh, 300 meters, you know, that's kind of like range. For point to point uh, for our radio, we can support up to uh, four miles or 6,000 6, meters. That's kind of like the, you know, the, the extreme, uh, but Really, realistically, we see, you know, the capacity, the gigabit capacity, the availability, you know, a four nine or three nine and a half. Uh, we talk about, you know, really talk about a thousand meters range uh, as a reliable link with reasonable performance. Perfect. And just to confirm, 60 gigahertz is millimeter wave, correct? 60 gigahertz, yes. Perfect. Uh, no, Alan, let I me mean, just, uh, Cameron, if I can uh, jump, chime in for just a moment. And we look at the, the range of, of the 60 gigahertz. There's lots of different technology. And Cambium has, has products that go to 250 kilometers. So, you know, if, if, if range is your, if you wanted that 500 mile, uh, mile Tesla, you know, there, there's a car out there for you. Um, if you want 250 kilometers of, um, you know, of, of coverage with, with uh, you know, broadband, you know, Cambium's got the product for you. Uh, this, so this is a nice one. The reason we like the 60 gigahertz is it fits a nice little niche. It fits a little spot that we've been missing. And we're going to keep talking about this as we keep going. So I don't want to get a, too ahead of ourselves, but it does fit this nice little slot that's sitting in that 200, Alan, I'll say 200 to 350, 400 meters. It fits in that nice slot that we haven't really covered that well um, up until now. And it fits a right. whole set of new use cases use cases and businesses that people want to engage in that they've had to use essentially inferior technology to cover some of these use cases. Roger that. 
guys, we've got a few more questions here, but uh, why don't we why don't we continue on the conversation a little bit? We'll come back to some of these because I think that uh, some of these questions are actually going to get directly addressed already. So, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. Uh, so I, I was, uh, you know, some of the prep work we were doing on this. I, I've been hearing this statement called "60 gigahertz democ democratizes." I really struggle with that word. <laughs> uh, the internet. Uh, but, uh, Darren, can you walk me through that a little bit? I think it's a seven syllable word, Chris. I, I think six was your limit. So I, I apologize for that. That's uh, my bad. Um, seven syllable word, democratization of the internet. Um, you know, that, use, that term has been used quite a bit in the past. It was popular many years ago, mostly to talk about applications and the internet's access to resources, knowledge, knowledge, right? You know, a, a, a kid living in, in, in Africa, all of a sudden he has access to a world of knowledge that he didn't have access, his gener the generation before him did not have access to. That's the democratization of the internet. But in this, in this sense, we can also use that term because it also contributes. 60 gigahertz contributes to a gap, a gap, not in knowledge, but a gap in access to broadband resources that has been limited uh, to, to only a, a few people and a few companies. So if, um, until recently, uh, the only companies that could deliver gigabit or multi-gigabit, and actually one gig is where they kind of capped it, are the, you know, the cable MSOs and uh, the big cable MSOs, not the small ones, right? The big ones. Mm -hmm. The ones and the companies that could, afford, that could afford billions of dollars, billions of US dollars to deploy fiber optic networks. And then at the end of the day, those fiber networks did not go to every home like they intended. They still had to drop them onto an edge qualm or, or something else at the edge most of the time to get to the actual end point. So they spent billions of dollars and still didn't quite get there. But, but it's been limited to those types of companies, right? And everybody else, all the rest of us, have been left out of that, that multi-gigabit world. So what this is doing, the democratization aspect of this is that now anybody, and one of the, one of the questions which we will get to, uh, one of the questions somebody asks is, I'm, says I'm new to this technology, how do I get access to this spectrum? Hold on, we're gonna keep talking about that because that's what we're talking about right now. 60 gigahertz is available to anybody who wants to use this frequency, who wants to use these products that Cambium is delivering to deliver multi-gigabit broadband networks to their subscribers. So now we have, we have access to knowledge, we have access to the bandwidth that, that we need for, for the next decade. Right. Uh, uh Alan, give us, uh, give us the, the nerd's point of view here. Let's get a little bit technical. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, if you look at the, uh, I think, look at the industry. As a wireless industry in the past, when people talk about high capacity, as, as Darren said, you know, people really think about those cable MSOs uh, or fiber companies. And even when we start, like KMBM, uh, you know, when we start the, the, the initial wireless product, we really do those like start with five meg, 10 meg, eventually go to 20, 30, but we're still really compete with DSL uh, solution rather than fiber cable because we're not ready to talk about gigabit throughput. And the 60 gigahertz really enable us to provide a solution for those specifically wireless internet service providers. Now they have a new equipment or solution. They can really plug uh, compete directly with cable or fiber companies. Not only that, historically, because of, the, because of the DSL, you know, or the capacity, we're not able to use wireless technology to do. We already compete with DSL. The market is limited in the uh, rural area or suburban area. We're not ready to move to the urban market. And uh, urban market is, is very dominant by the cable guys. And you think about this now with 60 gigahertz, the consumer has a second choice. Now we can, they, they will be able to choose between a wireless service provider versus a cable company. So this really gives the bad pass, you know, bring this new technology, disrupt the, the, the existing way the industry set, set up to really bring the, the, new, the new choice for the operators, for the um, wireless, wireless internet service operators and also the customers to see a second choice. Uh, more than that, the 60 gigahertz solution, uh, even compared to fiber or cable solution, we deliver, we do the symmetrical uh, throughput, uplink and downlink. If you look at the cable company, majority of them, they do a pretty high speed for downlink, but uplink is limited. Uh, they have a relatively low throughput for uplink. 
And with the you know current pandemic, we, we see more and more video stuff ongoing. We do the video conference calls and kids do the online, uh, online uh, courses, you know, online school. So a lot of video things ongoing, they, they need, you need equal capacity for your uplink. And this really bring advantage even over fiber or uh, cable solution. So Chris, what are you uh, seeing from uh, the industry? Well, uh, what's happening to democratize um, the internet here when we're talking about 60 gig is the, the, key, the key message here is 60 gigahertz is unlicensed spectrum and therefore you don't pay for the license. So in that respect, it is free. Um, all you have to do is buy the equipment and install it properly um, is really why you can, you can call this democratizing the internet in that respect. But um, what I wanted to do is just kind of talk about where I see 60 gig uh, fitting in. So um, uh, all of us have heard of uh, Wi-Fi that gets used in like a campus environment. Um, these uh, Wi-Fi devices, you know, access points, gateways, that kind of thing, uh, use what's um, referred to as mid-band, mid-band frequencies. And this is 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, and, and soon 6 gig. This is all mid-band. And what you do uh, with mid-band uh, Wi-Fi is you connect hundreds or thousands of devices using, using these access points. Uh, historically, in order to get these um, access points, Wi-Fi access points to connect to one another is you, uh, you'd use ethernet, um, or if you wanted to connect one building to another, you might use mid-band again. But the, the idea uh, is if you're connecting devices using mid-band and then connecting those access points using mid-band, you have a choke point. A choke point is uh, there because uh, you know midband doesn't have all that much capacity. So here's where 60 gig uh, gigahertz um, fits in. It's it's higher frequency, so it has higher bandwidth. And because it's unlicensed, you don't have to call uh, like a mobile operator, like just like Verizon who sells millimeter wave, um, uh, you, or you don't have to install fiber to connect one building to another or to bring a broadband service to. Uh, a building and it, um, so 60 gigahertz is, uh, is, 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 as I said earlier, unique because it connects uh, at very high bandwidth and um, you know, you don't have to pay for the spectrum. So uh, I, see, I see this as uh, democratizing, you know, the, the link or multiple links uh, in, in, a, you know, in the ranges that we were talking about with Alan and Darren earlier. So um, that's how I see it democratizing uh, the, the internet. Um, we have a few questions that we're going to jump in here really quick. Um, this is from Jeff. Is this like private LTE or public spectrum? Uh, and is besides this event and this recording, is there other documentation that can be shared surrounding 60 gigahertz? Don't all speak up. So, uh, so we're, I'd be very happy to address that if, if you'd like. Um, so, uh, uh, what we're talking about when we say 60 gigahertz is spectrum, you can kind of run whatever you want over it. Um, it, it, it could be LTE, 5G, proprietary, Wi-Fi, it, all, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we're just talking about spectrum. And the, the idea behind the spectrum is it's, it's, it's a, a unique asset uh, to use and it's unlicensed. Sorry, Darren, I didn't mean to step on you there. Go ahead. No, no I, was, I, was, I, was just, I was just gonna comment there on the, the really the second, heck, second half of that question about where do they access more, more, tech, more information about it. And we'll cover that in a minute, but let's just give you the, the quick answer right now. We'll give you some more details on that. Uh, Cambium has information on our product. We have information about technology in general we have information about other RF and wireless technologies, and it's all available to our partners. We'll come back to that. Chris, did you have more that you wanted to add to that answer? Uh, well, um, if because if not, I've got other questions. I just no, want to no, I think I think of, of an answer. I answered it. basically. You know, there's spectrum, and then there's technology that runs over spectrum. The, the, in most licensing uh, locations, most geographies and countries, you can kind of uh, run. The technology you want over the spectrum and it varies from country to country but you know here we are uh, talking primarily to a North American audience and and I think you can say you can run whatever you want over uh, the FCC license unlicensed spectrum awesome um, Darren you mentioned you've got you've got a product that goes 250 kilometers what is that product 
<laughs> you know what? I'm gonna have to have Alan. I got I got I got I got to uh, uh, plead ignorance here on that. Alan, why don't you go ahead and take that? He's the he's our sure. resident <laughs> expert on that. The long range stuff. I can't see that. So far. we have a link. We have a PTP six seventy product line using the sub six gigahertz, and we have one link deployed. Not actually, that one is a test link uh, in Colorado. Uh, basically from the peak of the mountain, shoot for a basin on the other side. That link is basically, I think that one is 200, uh, the link was 230 or 20. We have a YouTube link, go to our KMIM YouTube. That we, we have a demo specific for that link and that's the product we're using. Awesome. Um, okay, let's continue. So we're, we're chatting 60 gigahertz, and it sounds to me like when we, when we think 60 gigahertz, we're thinking areas with high numbers of users and lots of devices that need connectivity, campuses, industrial campuses, conference centers, and so on. Uh, is that about right? Is that where you see 60 gigahertz playing? And Chris, I'm going to start with you because you actually touched on this earlier in your, in your last answer. Well, I, I, do, I do see 60 gigahertz um, uh, technology that runs on 60 gigahertz being very applicable to the campus environment. Um, well, I, I can think of a couple examples just to, to share them where you could use 60 gigahertz um, to great effect. Uh, for instance, you could do backhauling traffic at venues um, like uh, sports stadiums, concerts, uh, the concert stadiums, that kind of thing. Um, 60 gigahertz uh, is applicable when you're connecting a, a building to a broadband connection in, in, like a, in a way you can say it would be replacing fiber. Um, you could enable outdoor Wi-Fi hotspots. Uh, I'm not talking about the Wi-Fi, but bringing a connection to the to the hotspot uh, that are not directly connected to build to a building. The thing that comes to mind is you've uh, heard of these um, sort of like drive-through uh, uh, COVID pop-up test uh, uh, locations where they need computers to you know connect to Wi-Fi, or like a fast food you know um, drive-through. Uh, connecting buildings to one another at a university or at a large company is a very obvious example. Um, and then something, uh, something that kind of comes to mind here is like you could, if you're a managed service provider, you can enable, uh, you could bring in a new service to a customer uh, in, in a campus or in an office building where there already is service, um, but you, you know, you don't have access to those uh, uh, wires or, or, or optics. Um, you can connect apartment buildings, uh, MDUs, healthcare facilities. Um, uh, you can deploy Internet of Things um, either indoor or outdoors by, you know, enabling Wi-Fi, Zigbee, Bluetooth. Um, you can enable surveillance systems. Um, you can do a lot. Yeah, I mean, I, I could go on probably for another 10 minutes. I'm just, you know, rattling off the top of my head. <laughs> It's just as exciting as I imagine that would be for the audience. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, Darren, is there anything that you wanted to add to yeah. that? Yeah, absolutely. So, the, so Chris, you kind of laid out some of those some of those key use cases. So, you know, what does it take to build that? Right? What does it take to to put that network into uh, a campus type of, type environment? Well, you need you need three basic parts, right? First of all, you need to have a common, easy, pervasive, and universal way to access the the the, the edge of the network, and that's Wi-Fi. That's absolutely Wi-Fi because every one of these devices, you know, phones and things that we have, they all have a Wi-Fi chip in them. I mean, I'll say 99.99% because if I say 100%, someone's going to come up with one device that for whatever reason doesn't have a Wi-Fi chip in it. I, I don't know what that device is, but I'm sure it's out there. But let's just, let's just agree that every device has, has the, the necessary chip to connect to the edge, okay? So that's, that's going to be right here in our, in our, in our phone. You need that. Secondly, so, so you need the access point that provides that connectivity um, in a high density environment. So that access point itself has to be kind of special. Next, you need a multi-gig backhaul because once you get 20, 30, 50, 100, 200 people in an area, all connect 500 people connected to an access point, 1,000 people. See, now you're starting to get into the numbers that that uh, there's so much packet contention, you really do have to have a high speed multi-gig backhaul. Now, some people uh, have used uh, the five gigahertz radio to, to build that backhaul and to provide the edge connectivity. That, that works great in a lab, honestly. Works great in a lab, works great in your house, 
if you've got five, 10, 15 devices, and most of them aren't doing much of anything inside your house, awesome, great mesh technology, reuse the five gig, beautiful, I love it. But don't do that if you're building out a high capacity uh, public network or access network that has to service a business. So you wanna connect it back to uh, 60 gigahertz, high bandwidth, no, it's not gonna interfere with your, your access. Number three, once you build this network out, um, you can't walk away and leave it, right? So you wanna manage it, you wanna manage it all the time, you wanna make sure that that management is always on. Put it in the cloud, cloud management, because why the cloud? Uh, you could put a little PC on premises, throw a little bit of management software on there, you can probably download some and do that, but why would you do that? Why would you even consider putting a little piece of management software on a PC that you, you drop on site and then you forget about it and a year later, someone kicked it over and it, it, the hard drive died and your network is down. So the cloud is great because the cloud never sleeps, it never sleeps. Cloud is redundant just by its design of its architecture. The cloud is redundant. The data centers, the, the, the servers are automatically backed up. Everything is backed up. Everything, the paths are redundant. So those are the three basic pieces. Common pervasive Wi-Fi, multi-gig backhaul, common you know, cloud management system. And you, you do those three things, you've got yourself a great, a great network management for your, for your business or your customer. So I wanted, uh, uh, curiosity is uh, setting in a little bit. We're talking a little bit about wireless. Uh, so where else where a wireless deployment um, really is really needed today and how does 60 gigahertz specifically play into that? Where else? Um, uh, so transportation logistics, I've mentioned that before. There's, uh, they're digitizing the analog world and, and they, they're, it's, it's a digital transformation. They're trying, they've gone through that years ago. Uh, transportation markets, that's what keeps things moving. If you look at this, uh, we haven't really had a lot of uh, transportation interruptions during this COVID shutdown. And we, we expected that there would be, but why not? Well, a large part of that, we have to say it's because the, these transportation companies are digitized and they've, their operations are efficient. And that process, we've, we've shown that it works. We've shown that it, it makes the network better and their, their business is better. That's a great market because that, that transformation is just gonna continue, uh, digitizing all of those uh, transportation logistics processes. That means port facilities. Where, where products are coming off of a, off a ship, putting them on a truck or a train, all of that is, is digitizing um, IP-based camera systems to, to backhaul security for, for all sorts of reasons, including temperature reading for or COVID, but potentially temperature reading of massive people, lots of that. Uh, municipal urban networks, cities want to attract visitors and so they wanna put, put a pervasive Wi-Fi around points of interest and it attracts people, it gives them a, a, a network that they can use to, to even support their own citizens with municipal uh, access. Um, mission critical networks are found everywhere, retail, hospitality, uh, enterprise networks. So the Wi-Fi today is mission critical. My house is mission critical. Uh, I was talking to a guy a week ago at, at, a, at a virtual trade show that I, that I attended and he was a tech guy, you know, he's a service system integrator. And he says to me, he says, you know, I thought, my, I thought I had a great Wi-Fi network at home, but I found out that my network is not pandemic ready. Now, what, what a great phrase, it's not a, not a pandemic ready Wi-Fi because he wasn't ready to support the bandwidth that he needed to support in his house for himself, his wife, and his kids going to school. That was just like a week ago. Um, but now take that into any enterprise. Is it, is it ready for the, the densities that we see? And so really, uh, so what we're looking at is think about wireless networking and, and access to networks like a utility. It's like water, power, and Wi-Fi. The, those three things go together. Well, that was a lot there, but I'm sure Alan has got a little bit to add. Sure. Uh, I think uh, Darren touched about municipal enterprise. Um, so they look at the other side, we have the service providers. I mean, they can use 60 gigahertz to provide the high-speed internet. And they can be go to the urban market, go to the suburban market, or go to the rural market. And uh, we see the people using the like uh, street infrastructure, use the light pole uh, in the city or in the suburban market uh, to cover the you know wires to the building or wires to the residential house. When they when they move out of the city, we also see people using the 60 gigs with the rooftop setup 
So from there, they form the mesh, extend the coverage, and uh, to do a high-speed coverage. So that is on the internet service provider side. Uh, back to the uh, enterprise or municipal side, there are deployment using 60 gigahertz to backhaul smart city. So in the smart city, they're using the, uh, a lot of place using cameras, and they need a high-speed backhaul for that. They also want redundancy. So with the mesh network, it provides a much better, you know, in the case of link failure or equipment failure, the data will be rerouted. So that is another applications, you know, can be using 60 gigahertz. I mean, to me, I, I, I think is, if I want to simplify this one is, you think about 60 gigahertz as a high capacity uh, distributed backhaul layer. It can do many things. Uh, you know, I, I think many users, we see our uh, end user community, they're more creative than what we can imagine initially think, oh, this is a place, this is a location. Instead, you know, you just look at, oh, this is a place. I need gigabit capacity. I need, uh, I know it's a relatively short range and uh, it's line of sight outdoor. If those one is, can fit, 60 gigs can fit many of those applications. So uh, Chris, I want to get your perspective, but, but, but before I go there, I think it's a good time just to answer one of these questions. Uh, and it said, how many stations can connect to a 60 gigahertz access point? So in the point multi-point configuration, uh, one of our distribution node or more like a access point, we can connect up to 30 devices. Okay, thank you. So Chris, give us, uh, give us the non-manufacturing speak here. Yeah, okay. Um, so I, I think what, what, what we're talking about uh, in many cases here is backhauling of Wi-Fi, backhauling of mid-band Wi-Fi, like I was talking about earlier. And, and historically, that's been done using Ethernet cables, or when you're connecting uh, one building to another, uh, you know, fiber optics uh, connections. And um, the, the, the key here is that wiring or, or cabling uh, with fiber optics is expensive. And when you have a high bandwidth backhaul system um, that would run over 60 gigahertz, this is a good substitute for for retrenching from building to building or, um, you know, ru running, running uh, e Ethernet cables. Um, so e the way I look at this, this is kind of like, you know, what historically we've called microwave backhaul that connects cell towers, except for you can use this on a campus uh, within an organization's boundaries or a link from a service provider over to, over to this campus. So um, there's a, a lot of utility here um, with 60 gigahertz. Now, because this is unlicensed, what it does is allows the uh, company who's making the installation to, it doesn't need to be a telco, it can be uh, a systems integrator, a VAR, that kind of thing. And um, I think this is really a key because we're dealing with unlicensed technology and companies like Cambium are bringing products that, that serve the 60 gigahertz market. So we're opening up a, a lot of um, you know, alternative technology that gets ar around the problem of wiring and uh, needing to bring in a, a telco who um, you know, deals with their, their licensed spectrum. Uh, we have a few questions that I want to I want to jump in on here. Um, a few have been here for a little bit. So uh, both Phil and Kevin have asked, "What's up with rain fade and atmospheric absorption and impact on link reliability?" Uh, I think Fasal also just asked that question. So let's go right ahead and give him that answer. So uh, the rain fade, <clears throat> any any frequency once you're above eleven gigahertz, you start to see some rain fade. And that is a common thing applied to 60 gigahertz as well. When we go to 60 gigahertz, rain fade will cause, you know, some significant uh, attenuation for the link budget. Um, of course, you know, depends on where you are, uh, the, the impact will be different. Uh, we top, you know, we have the area which, which have very heavy rain, then you need to really back off your design to have more fit margin to protect, you know, to for your system gain. Uh, so you have a better system availability out of your design. On the other side, uh, so that's why, you know, uh, your uh, 60 gig is really not designed for long range thing. Not only about the uh, oxygen absorption, also this ring fit together makes 60 gigahertz really a short distance link. But on the other side, 
the 60 gigahertz uh, mesh is an important thing for 60 gigahertz because you know the with the mesh uh, you will be able to grow the network by the meshing itself self grow or expansion it also can help you to work around obstruction and extend your coverage and that, that, that is quite important in addition it also provides the system availability the the ring impact and uh, uh, oxygen absorption this will only this will really impact the link to link availability even you have uh, let's see every link is say a uh, 39 uh, 0.5 uh, link availability. But if you form a mesh, the topology will help you improve your network availability because you lost a link by a hardware failure or by, uh, by rain or for one direction. The, uh, the whole network will not last the whole thing you, because you have the redundancy. You know, if you think about uh, uh, like some of, the, some of the design we have been involved uh, in a network, you have multiple uh, fiber pop site. And uh, if if one site was down, the data will be rerouted to the other pop site. So your system availability is different view. Uh, that will help you actually, you know, the mesh will help you improve to achieve a better system availability. Even your link specific availability may not be a full NI design. Perfect. Um... There's one here. Uh, there's, there's there's one about Starlink, and I want to I want to I want to get to that question. Uh, just to, I think a little closer towards the end of our discussion here. Uh, and there's one specific question here, and then I think we should move on. So, um, what are the power requirements for 60 gigahertz um, SM or remote? Right? Is is there a recommended solar power or battery solution to go along with the SM? And here's a specific example. Um, this individual wants to mount a camera on a parking light pole, but the AC power to that pole shuts down during the day uh, to deactivate the light. Um, how would you design the power for your SM and the camera? Okay, so I, I think I can talk about specifically for our own our product. So the what it's called, by the way, C and Wave. We have three models within C and Wave. The V five thousand model is the AP or DN. We call it distribution node. And the V5000 node, the power consumption is 35 watts maximum. And we also, from the AP, we also provide a, a PoE out. We can power uh, outdoor Wi-Fi or uh, anything 802.3AT compatible PoE device, like a camera or something. If you enable the PoE, the total power consumption could go up to 65 watts. So that's on the AP side. So if no new PoE device used, up to 35 watts. On the other side, on the SM, or we, we call CN client node, we have a model called V1000. The V1000 only 10 watts. It is powered by 8023 AF standard PoE. Uh, single cable, you know, copper cable, uh, one gig copper cable connection. So if you talk about, I think you talk about the parking lot or, you know, kind of like set up there, then if you deploy a V1000, the radio itself only take 10 watts. You know, if you, to, uh, if you do a solar panel uh, with a local uh, battery uh, backup there, uh, that works very well. For the radio itself, we do the PoE power, but also we have the way we can power the radio by DC cable. Uh, so in the case of the, like the, when you form a, think about different location in a fiber pop site, of course, you have a run down cable go with the fiber side. But in, in, the, uh, in the site with mesh, many of the DN side could be a radio side. When you have those radio side, you don't have any cable come down. Everything is on the top of the tower. So we also can power the radio directly with DC. So we have an outdoor AC-DC module. So you can take the power from the light pole um, and convert AC to DC, then power the radio from DC. Then, you know, all the data will be transmit you know within the radio between sector sectors uh, so the the installation will be very neat and uh, that is what we are trying to push the you know get the lowest uh, cost of ownership uh, using our same wave design perfect thanks for that explanation i promise you i understood all of it so <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll run the test later <laughs> we've uh, I, obviously we've got a lot of uh 
of system integrators, partners uh, on this call here. They can tell by the way that these questions are coming over. So let's dive in uh, for a little while on that. As a partner, uh, what market segments should they be focusing on? Is it enterprise, education? You know, let's let's expand on that a little bit because I think we're talking about now uh, a blend of kind of the traditional outdoor Wi-Fi partners and then the traditional VAR community um, having the ability to sell, you know, kind of get into each other's ways now. Yep, you, you're right about that, Chris. This is the intersection of those two different markets and two different types of uh, types of experience levels. So, you know, I encourage people to look at their own, look in their own, their own life and their own community. Look around you in your own business, and you will you will see the opportunities. You can find this um, uh, in if you if you have a lot of government contract type of business, uh, you might find that the municipal urban networks or government funded projects around education uh, would be something that you could use this for in right in your own market without without having to. Uh, stretch beyond uh, what, your, what your, your comfort level is. Uh, transportation logistics, that, that's scattered everywhere. Uh, transportation hubs are located outside of every city, just all in, in every, every corner you can possibly look. They're, they're all over the place. Uh, trans, so transportation, ports, facilities, mission critical applications. So just look in your own, in your own uh, business. If you're, if you're focused on indoor enterprise Wi-Fi, just look outside the building, look outside the window and connect up buildings together in a business park. And it's an opportunity to do that as well. So Alan, can you uh, take that a, a little bit further, um, specifically about the VAR that just sells Wi-Fi? Sure, I mean, um, so two, actually three months ago, we announced it a uh, Wi-Fi 6. And uh, when you see the Wi-Fi technology moving, now the, the AP ready give you a gigabit's mm -hmm. capacity on the Wi-Fi spot. And when you have the Wi-Fi AP can do gigabits, you don't want your backhaul become a bottleneck for your service. So when you need a gigabit backhaul, you know, ideally we want a fiber, but unlikely fiber will be everywhere. So you really need a solution to connect from the fiber location to your Wi-Fi solution. And 60 gigabits is a good fit there because we not only we provide gigabit capacity, but also because of mesh we have, it's we do the load balancing and it's a distribution distributed backhaul layer connect your Wi-Fi to your fiber, uh, fiber location. And this really, you know, remove the bottleneck to give you the two gigabits experience to end user. So Chris, what are you seeing from your research? Well, uh, you know, I, I just echo what Alan and Darren said. If if um, if you're uh, involved with installing Wi-Fi and Ethernet, um, you know, 60 gigahertz can uh, do just as Darren said, connect buildings together that where you might have otherwise had to install, you know, fiber optics. And then if you're in the business of getting a an internet service to customers, uh, um, you know, or historically you've used midband. Uh, this 60 gig technology is able to uh, serve customers in much denser areas at very high bandwidth. So um, I don't think I can add more other than to just to, to say to say that those are the two opportunities that I see. So now we're going to get into the good questions. Specifically, and Darren, this is going to you first. How does Camium compare to industry peers, competitors? Well. Well, certainly uh, some competitors of Cambium are using similar technology to Cambium. Uh, they have access uh, to some of the uh, same underlying uh, silicon that we do uh, when, when sort of setting down to architect a solution. Uh, so so in, in some ways you could say, oh, you're just like company XYZ. But, but look beyond that. And so what Cambium has done is really brought together all the pieces needed uh, to build a network. And of course, we, we have applied our, our experience. We've, we have massive experience uh, going back with 20 years in outdoor wireless and, and all of the complexities around that. And we applied that knowledge and that experience to this product. We think it makes it superior just in simply delivering bits over, over that RF. Uh, we think we do, a, we do a great job of that. But then we take that next step and we build out the, the access edge network. And Alan, thank you for mentioning the, the Wi-Fi 6 product. That's actually my product, Alan. So what, what, where, where did I fail here today? Uh, that's it right there. I, I failed to mention my own product line, which is Wi-Fi 6 access points. 
Um, so we have great Wi-Fi 6 access points. They are fantastic. And, and I'll drop a line here, uh, you know, no, no premium for Wi-Fi 6. Uh, if you guys have ever seen the old Saturday Night Live uh, skit from with Kevin Nealon years ago, no premium for Wi-Fi 6, when he did the uh, Mr. Subliminal, no premium for Wi-Fi 6. Um, that's what we have. So we have the edge access point, the Wi-Fi 6 APs, no premium for Wi-Fi 6. We have the multi-gigabit 60 gigahertz, and we have the cloud management that ties it all together. So from the cloud to the client, we, we have all the pieces, no pre premium for Wi-Fi 6. And that's it. So gonna, uh, I'll, I'll stop right there. I'm going to ask that question. <laughs> Thank you. Alan, anything you want to add? Sure. Uh, I think uh, Darren touched that. I want to give a little bit more details there. So yes, from us, we, we not only provide a product, we provide the complete end-to-end -end solution. Uh, and uh, we have the CMS tool to do the end-to-end -end management. So you can, you know, with the function feature, func uh, feature function building there, and it help you to see the whole thing. And also we have the QoS align the whole, whole solution as well. So that's the one side. Uh, more than that, we not only give you the equipment network planning, we also help customers do their planning. I mean, network planning. We have different tools available today from Cambium. We have the scene heat tool to provide heat map and also help customers doing the three gigahertz CBR span and other things. And we will have 60 gigahertz added in the scene heat in the future. Currently, we have Link Planner, another tool to help customers planning their links for 60 gigahertz. We also offer another tool called AMP tool, advanced network planning tool uh, for people to help, help people design the 60 gigahertz. The unique, unique thing about AMP tool is, it's not just about a network design. We also embedded the OPEC and the CAPEC cost in there together with a budget number you, you know, from customers. So with all the radio characters, your design performance expectation your OPEC and an OPEC uh, CAPEC cost, we build the business case together with the network design. If you change your financial numbers, and then uh, we will use that as the input to drive the optimal design uh, based on those, all those input. So uh, the idea is really, you know, trying to make everything much easier, not just, uh, you know, here, here you go, this is the box, you have to configure it. And we want to give you those zero touch, zero provision, uh, you know, zero provision and easy planning uh, from Cambium. Uh, so that's the kind of like the, I call what uh, Darren touched. On the other side, a little bit more details on technology. Our 60 gigahertz CM Wave product is based on the latest IEEE 802.11 standard. That is the AY standard. So before that in 2016, uh, IEEE published 802.11 AD for 60 gigahertz. And that standard is using the, you know, like Wi-Fi channel access, CSMA, no time synchronization. And with AY, we bring in, we're more focused for network performance. So we bring a new Mac using the TDMA, TDD with network synchronization. This greatly help improve the channel reuse, reduce interference, so, you know, we are using the latest technology as well. Together, we leverage the Facebook Telegraph technology with mesh support. This really, you know, we're trying to give you the best breed in the industry to help you, you know, build your own network. Mr. Dupuis, is there anything you'd like to add? There, there are uh, multiple competitors um, that sell indoor Wi-Fi. Uh, not, uh, not many, if at all, of these uh, companies have um, expertise in the wireless ISP market. And um, that is something that Cambium brings to the, to the party here um, that can help these, um, you know, enterprise oriented networks, um, uh, you know, deploy 60 gigahertz. So I think it's quite unique, actually, as I scan the, the competitive landscape. Perfect. I have a few more questions, uh, and then I know I know Chris is is ready to hot to trot. So there are there are six questions here, uh, and a few of these you might do lightning round style. Okay, uh, so the first question is from Faisal: Are there operators already using this product? I can safely say yes. I, I've talked to them. Perfect. 
Um, also from Faisal, what's the minimum channel bandwidth available on CN Wave? We're using the channel 2.16 gigahertz channel. We are, we are hardware ready to support 4.32 gigahertz channel as well. Perfect. And where could Faisal go to get more information on uh, RF planning? Go to Cambium webpage. Perfect. That was easy answer. Um, okay, this is, I'm excited about this question. I have an acreage uh, that I can't live in because the internet is not fast enough for me to do what I do for a living. So I've got this gorgeous acreage that I don't live in. I live in a nice little half duplex instead. That's awesome. Um, but I personally am excited because Starlink is maybe available in my area and that might be the solution to my connectivity woes. Do you see Cambium Network's terrestrial solutions, especially now that we have 60 gigahertz open, in competition to Starlink, or would these be used in a complementary manner? Um, okay, Who's going to catch that one? So Starlink is an interesting thing. I mean, uh, we haven't really seen how this will cost for customers and how the performance realistically for, for end users. I mean, uh, I used to work for a huge network, has some satellite experience. It's, 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 a, it's a pretty tough for satellite for high capacity when you have many customers trying to do it simultaneously. Uh, given the, uh, you know, I, I think we, we need to see the numbers, but I can see this is definitely will help for certain areas like those rural areas or the area they have the, you know, satellite had a big coverage. 60 gigahertz, we're talking about high density. If you're running using 60 gigahertz to cover a, a big area, that is not the right technology. Right. So I, I don't think we're ready to compete with them. I think it's a composition to each other. I mean, they can solve, you know, a middle of nowhere. I mean, unlikely somebody gonna lay down a fiber or <laughs> deploy a 60 gigahertz just to reach that location. And starting could be a good, play, good solution for that. Yeah, and, yeah. and Cam Cambium does a lot of this, Cameron. Uh, we, we do a lot of these partnerships with satellite companies, satellite operators in, in Africa, um, uh, South America, Central America, uh, quite a bit, actually, where they, they use, they get in some of these rural areas where they don't have fiber. They're not going to, it's just, they can't, right? So they'll, they'll use satellite to feed a hotspot. Now, remember, what, what is the thing we mentioned earlier about is in every one of these chips, is it a satellite receiver? No. Yeah. It's, so what, did I say that? I'm sorry, I wasn't very clear. Yeah, I probably, I probably did say that. Every one of these devices has a, has a, a Wi-Fi radio in it. So yeah. we're actually partnering with these satellite guys today. We're doing it right now. And they're, they're connecting up uh, our access points to using satellite to feed it. And it provides hotspots in some of these rural areas that, that people can't normally ac get access to. Yeah, I think there's two big takeaways from this question. The first is that Darren's got Elon on speed dial. Very good to know. The second is, um, and, and Starlink has explicitly said, their solution is ideal for rural environments where it is not high density, right? So, and I kind of knew that going in. I just wanted to see what was up with that. Um, a couple more questions here, and then we're going to move on. Uh, do you have examples of successful mixed mode and mixed tech implementations in a North American market? The reason why uh, this individual is asking that question is because in Canada, the internet has been legislated as an essential service. And this is a new market area opened by legislation for rural and suburban areas. So in North America right now, we have um, several customers doing the kind of like uh, small deployment uh, using our six, 60 gigahertz product. Um, so, you know, given the, the timeline, we, we expect more and more customers will deploy that and we will share more details about applications. Uh, today, we're doing those one. We have the point-to-point -point deployment, point-to-multipoint. We also have the mesh setup uh, deployment today in the field uh, in North America. Perfect. Um, so the frequency range uh, is only between 57 gigahertz and 66 gigahertz. So if they're using the 2.16 gigahertz channel width, we only get around four usable channels. Is that correct? Correct. Perfect. Last question. Um, one of the reasons that 60 gigahertz is an awesome solution for unlicensed is easy beam forming in uh, ISO location from co-channel interference. So what if, there, what if high bandwidth is not so important? Is 60 gigahertz better than five gigahertz or 900 megahertz uh, as a viable solution for remote locations that are not needing this high of bandwidth? So, um, sorry, okay, I'll try to answer this one. Uh, I think it's not like uh, one is over the other. It really depends on what you're looking for. If the capacity is not you're looking for, if your real challenge is distance or line of sight, 
then 900 megahertz or sub six gigahertz is a perfect solution um, because they can do better penetration. They can do not line of sight. 60 gigahertz is ready for short distance line of sight, high capacity. Um, it's really depends on what you're looking for. Perfect. Um, I guess a follow up question to an earlier one. Uh, can we have the option to use a uh, smaller channel width uh, so that they have more usable channels? Um, that is not supported today by our same wave. The smallest channel we support is 2.16 gigahertz. Perfect. All right, cool. That's well, we, uh, we, 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 we obviously have a lot of questions on how to, how, how to access some of this stuff. So let's talk a little bit about that. As a partner, how do I access this new technology? And also, if we could get in the weeds a little bit on how do we actually order it? Alan, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, so we have, uh, if you go to our uh, webpage, we have the product information posted there. We also have uh, dip different uh, uh, application nodes, uh, white paper around 60 gigahertz. Uh, so I highly recommend go to Cambium webpage. If you are a, a, a existing Cambium customer or a partner of Cambium, you can also go to the Cambium online training webpage. It's, uh, it's learning.cambiumnetworks.com. And we have training courses, you know, free training courses on CN Wave. All you need to do is you, need, you do need an account to log in, then uh, the course is free. Uh, it will tell you the product. To buy the product, uh, we, with the product already released uh, uh, for ready for pre-orders. And we know our distributors already have the orders as well. Uh, and the product will be shipping by end of October. Uh, so, you know, but all the partners, distributors, they're open to take orders. So if you have, if you want to order the product, you can also go to KMBM webpage to, to see where I want to order. We will provide you the list of uh, channel partners, uh, their contact, their name, and you can reach out uh, from there to, you know, order C and Wave and uh, to play this radios once we are shipping. So, so Cameron and Chris, there, there's no need for a partner to call a carrier. You don't have to call and try to get access to the spectrum. Uh, none of that complexity is involved here. It's literally just go to www.cambiumnetworks.com, upper right-hand corner, join the partner program, and, and you have access to the, the learning management system. You have access to the tools you need to quote, deploy, site survey, um, everything you need to be successful. Perfect. Well, uh, Cam, are there any more questions? Nope, we're clear. Oh, there's nope. some, actually, you know what? There's two in the chat here. Just about missed them. Uh, due to local regs, we cannot do outdoor PMP in 60 gigahertz. Is mesh still possible with CN Wave? Can we create mesh cabling V3000 all back to back? Or do, is there a mesh, mesh routing strictly built into the V5000? The, the mesh is, can be used for our, pro, uh, our product. So it's all the radio are software defined. So it's not saying mesh can only for a product. Uh, all CN Wave models support mesh. Uh, I, I, I missed the first question. What's the question? It's, uh... Uh, I would love to know about the tech that would replace the Force 180 for customer service, but with greater bandwidth capacity and how far in kilometers we could reach it. Oh, Force 180. Uh, no, there's so there's that... two separate questions here, it looks like. <laughs> so Force 180 is a five gigahertz radio. And uh, that one we, we normally talk about, you know, uh, I think four, five, six miles. If you, I think for Force 180 also have a connectorized version, if I'm correct. Connectorized version with a bigger dish can reach even longer distance. For the integrated dish version, uh, you know, normally we talk about uh, four, five, six miles range. Okay. And then we have one more question, two more questions. <laughs> There's a lot of interest in these guys. Uh, 900 megahertz was great until it got crowded. 60 gigahertz is great because it's not crowded. Uh, do you think 60 gigahertz is somewhat future-proof as a result of the line of sight and, and, and range? Um, yeah. So for 60 gigahertz, because we're using the uh, AY standard, we can do one network, one channel. Uh, so there is a big improvement or uh, you know, frequency reuse compare with other frequency. Normally, like if you go with 900 megahertz or five gigahertz, you do need several channels to do a network plan. 
And in our thing is we do one channel, one network. Literally, you don't need to do frequency planning because you choose channel one, you're using channel one everywhere. Um, but, you know, 60 gigahertz only have four channels available or for, you know, we are supporting from channel one, channel four. So literally we have four channels. Uh, if you do have many operators, let's say in the location you have more than four operators going to operate in the same location, uh, I think that will bring the challenge uh, for interference. Uh, hopefully, I think by business, by economic nature, once you have up to four operators in the same location, the, the new one probably will not really enter to this area given, um, you know, there is no really no free channels. If you add in, not only your own network will not run properly or get the performance you want, you will also cross uh, interference the other channel network. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, we do recommend or we suggest some coordination between operators to maximize uh, frequency um, or spectrum usage on 60 gigahertz. All right, and actually the last question, um, concerning the MTU size, is there any model that's able to support jumbo frames? Today we support jumbo frame up to 4,000 byte and we will support 9,600 bytes in the future software. Perfect. Okay, we are actually uh, nine minutes over time. I would like to thank uh, Christian Pui showing up. That was awesome. You provided great insight. I learned a lot from you and I'll be nagging you on LinkedIn for sure. Darren and Alan's always fabulous to talk to both of you and uh, Chris Lee, you're okay. Anyway, so uh, this is going to be hosted on YouTube. Uh, we're going to get that up in the next day or so. We'll drop an email to everybody. So if you want to uh, reference it out, you can. We're also breaking this down into smaller clips and we're covering you know, specific topics. So you'll be able to find what you want. I think a little bit easier. I'd like to thank everybody who attended today and taking an hour and nine minutes out of your day. Uh, Cameron and Chris from Channel Bites would love to say, have a great, is it Wednesday? Have a great Wednesday. Great Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.